Welcome to the Raise with Jesus podcast, 10 minutes of day where the life of Jesus meets yours. This is our podcast episode for February 9th, 2020, and we'll get to our Bible reading later today. But right now we have a sermon from Professor John Brugge, um, where God's word says what it means and means what it says. Here goes. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text we have heard read as our epistle. I'll read some of the key parts. We have the word of the prophets as something more sure, and we will do well to pay attention to it. Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. By scripture alone. That's one of the three great mottos of the Lutheran Reformation. It was a very key one and maybe even one of the most important factors in bringing the Reformation about. It also is very vital and important to the church and to every Christian today. When Luther was getting the Reformation underway, the Catholic Church threw two questions at him to try to knock him off the course he was following. The first was, What makes you think that you are right in the things you are teaching? All the leading theologians and authority of the church disagree with you. They ask him a second question. What right do you have to be challenged in the authority of the pope and the emperor? They have told you, stop preaching this teaching. To that, Luther had two very simple answers. Scripture is clear. It says what it means. And if Scripture clearly teaches we're justified by faith alone without our works, it really doesn't matter if the whole world says something different. Scripture not only is clear, Scripture also has authority. It means what it says. And since these two principles brought back out into the light by Luther were so important in the creation of the Reformation and so important today, they will serve as the theme of our Reformation thoughts. God's word, it says what it means. God's word, it means what it says. First of all, scripture is clear. It says what it means. This is the first part of our text. We have the words of the prophet as something more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The Bible is compared to a light that shows people how they may walk safely in the darkness. In fact, we could say in this sinful world, it's really the only light we have until Christ the light himself returns and we see the glory of his light in person. Scripture is so clear that even the uneducated can understand its truths. Psalm 19 tells us, the testimony of the Lord makes wise the simple. The teaching of the Lord gives light to the eyes. Scripture was so clear that the lay people of the new congregation at the city of Berea could use the clear scripture to judge even the teaching of the great apostle Paul. Scripture was so clear that Grandma Lois and Mom Eunice could use the scripture to teach young Timothy the way to salvation while he was still a tiny young child. Scripture is so clear that a child can understand its truth. So when learned theologians or philosophers have to write long, complicated books to try to explain away what the Bible means and to make it mean something different, the problem is not really with the words of the Bible. The problem is with unbelief that rejects those words. 
This is my body. Are any of those words hard to understand? And then think how much ink has been spilled to try to show this really isn't Jesus' body. And it's not that now people have gotten so modern and sophisticated that the Bible has become old and out of date. Even for us with our sinful nature, it's always been hard for people to understand and to accept and to put trust in the words of God. Think of how Sarah laughed when she was promised a child in her old age. Think of how Thomas doubted Jesus' resurrection and said, well, unless I touch it myself, I won't believe it. No, the problem is not with Scripture. Scripture has always been clear, and it's clear today. You all know many, many examples that you could use to make this point. Take creation. God, in six regular days, made the world and everything in it by the power of his word out of nothing. He then made Adam from the dust of the ground and made Eve from his side. It's pretty, harder, it's pretty hard to tell a simpler story than that, isn't it? The problem is not the clarity of scripture, but when human reason and so-called science is set against the clear words of scripture. Scripture asks all of us to believe many things that we have never seen. I think that it's probably unlikely that any of you here this morning have seen an angel. Possible, but probably not. And yet we know from God's word who the angels are, what they do, and how they watch over us from the beginning of our life to the end. Scripture is very clear. And if at times there are some passages that we're a little puzzled when we first read them, <clears throat> we can follow another rule and principle that was very important to Luther. Scripture interprets Scripture. So when we find a thought a little hard to understand in one place, we keep reading the whole Bible, and it becomes clear to us elsewhere. Or even if there are still some passages which we struggle to understand, then we don't jump to the conclusion, well, there must be something wrong with the Bible here. But whether we say, Lord, there's something still weak in my understanding through your Holy Spirit, through study, and through prayer, Make it more clear to me what you are saying to me here at this point. <clears throat> Scripture is clear, and it's clear most of all in the truths that pertain to our salvation. God's law is clear. It says what it means, and it means what it says. God's law says we are all by nature sinful, that none of us could make it to heaven or please God left on our own that we're already born in sin, and that sin separates from a holy God, and those who have the guilt of sin resting upon them would be separated from God in hell. Those aren't just figures of speech. Those are reality. And those words are very clear. Hell is a real place. And as hard as those words are for sinners to bear, we can say that in some ways, those clear words of Scripture were the first step in creating the Lutheran Reformation. Luther understood those clear words very, very well. And it crushed him. It oppressed him. It made him filled with fear because the law spoke so clearly. And in his desperation to get out from under that crushing load, he frantically searched the scriptures and said, there has to be something more than this. And to his joy, of course, he found that there was. The gospel words are as clear as can be. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, dying a criminal's death on the cross, 
was actually the Son of God paying for all of the sins of all of the world. There's nothing unclear there, but it's very offensive to the very heart of human reason and self-confidence. The great American author Mark Twain was an unbeliever, but we have to give him credit. He was a pretty honest unbeliever. He said, it's not the things in the Bible that are unclear that are the reason I'm an unbeliever. It's the things that are clear that make me an unbeliever. Jesus Christ, true God and true man, is the only way to heaven, dying for all of the sins of the world. That's as clear as anything can be. And that was the great joy that Luther found in the great dangers that confronted him. He felt the crushing burden of the law lifted off him. He felt himself being filled with joy to know that not some, but all of his sins were paid for. And he began to experience God not as an angry judge, but as a loving father. And because scripture was so clear on these things, Luther then also found the courage to speak boldly the great truths of our salvation by grace alone and by faith alone. He read these words in scripture so clearly that it left no doubt in his mind that he could say, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. And he found strength not only in Scripture's clarity, but also in its authority. Scripture means what it says. If in the Bible, Luther had just found a bunch of opinions from various apostles and prophets on religion, and there were all kinds of competing theories there, there would be nothing that would bind him or the church. If Scripture was simply a collection of human opinions... Well, we could treat it pretty much like a salad bar or the buffet at Golden Corral. We could kind of mosey through it, look things over, pick out the things that were really appealing to us and take a pass on the things that really didn't catch our fancy. But if scripture is the authoritative commands of the one who has all power in heaven and earth, then the only appropriate reaction is acceptance and Obedience. And this was the course that Luther was ready to take. God's word does not come to us as proposals or suggestions. It comes to us as truths and as commands. And that's why Luther could speak so confidently and defy all the worldly authorities because he felt and knew the authority of the word of God. When Luther stood up so courageously and said, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. He was simply speaking with the same authority that any speaker of God's clear words had spoken throughout all the ages of the church history. Think of when Moses came to Pharaoh. He didn't say, you know, Pharaoh, God would, our God would like to have his people go to worship him. And we're really requesting and suggesting that you would let us go. No, he said, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go. When Paul had to deal with unrest and disturbance in the early congregation, especially the congregation at Corinth, where they really weren't respecting the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the Lord's Supper, when they were worshiping in a different way that disregarded Christian principles of worship and the relationship of men and women. Paul didn't say, I have some suggestions and proposals for how you could be a better congregation. He said, what we need to acknowledge is that what I am writing to you is the commands of God, the commands of the Lord. And if scripture is clear authority from God, that leaves the church with a very clear agenda set before it. If God's word says what it means and means what it says, then no church has any right to teach anything other than what God's word teaches. And no church has any right to omit anything that God's word teaches, no matter how unpopular it may be at the moment. 
And it really isn't any different for us as individual Christians or in our family if we're a congregation of two or three or four or five. We have no right to do things, whatever they may be, that God's word forbids. And we have no right to omit things that God's word commands. And that's why a Lutheran church, or another way of saying it, a biblical church, which is an heir of the Reformation, is going to be concerned about everything it teaches, both small and great. Now, to be sure, all of us would say there are some teachings in the Bible that are more crucial to our faith and life than others. Virgin birth, deity of Christ, doctrine of forgiveness, perhaps even the sacraments. Everything is not of equal importance. But if I gave you a choice or you were confronted with a terrorist choice, I will cut off your head or your arm or your hand or the tip of your little finger. What would you answer? I know I would say, are there any more options? One thing may be worse than another, but I don't really like any of those options. <clears throat> Why not the option of keeping my body whole and intact the way God made it? And if we want that for our physical body, don't we want that even more for our spiritual food and for the body of Christ? Not all doses of poison are equally damaging. What a heartbreaking tragedy would be if either we served or were served a meal which was poison and led to someone's death. It would still be bad enough if some of the guests simply had a couple pretty uncomfortable days as a result of the food. You might not immediately notice if your food just had pesticides in it in parts per thousand even parts per million. But you really wouldn't want that either, would you? And what if you go to a wonderful restaurant and you're having a great, nourishing, delicious bowl of soup and there's a hair in it? Or worse yet, there's a fly swimming around in it. Would you want anything that detracted from the enjoyment and the beauty and the benefit of pure food? I think all of us would say, of course not. We want our food to be as pure as it can possibly be. And if that's how we feel about our everyday food, how much more won't we as Lutheran biblical Christians, as really all Christians should, feel that way about God's word? If God's word says what it means, and it means what it says, then with the help of the Holy Spirit, we are to strive to do everything we can to keep it pure. And why would we do this? Not because it's a Lutheran rule, or the Lutheran catechism says so, or it's a tradition, or certainly not on this Reformation Day, we wouldn't think we're doing it to earn God's favor somehow and get in good with him through our efforts. No, it's much simpler than that, isn't it? If we, if we respect the God who created us, if we love the God who saved us, if we're thankful to the God who richly and daily provides for us, we will listen to his word in the things that seem very big and the things that seem very small. As a church, we know there's no other way for the church to really be united in harmony and love unless they're united and in harmony with the word. And there's no better way to find happiness in life, in our own personal life, in everyday affairs, in the crisis of life, in the everyday things. There's no better way to find happiness than to follow the directions of the Creator. We've received a great gift from the Bible and then renewed to us through the Reformation to understand that God's Word says what it means. God's Word means what it says. So let us hold on to, let us defend, let us share, and let us live in these truths. God's word says what it means. God's word means what it says. 
Amen.